What is up, Ewu crew? Today, we have three cases for you with unexpected twists that we promise you won't see coming. Let's get into it. Married couples often have promises between each other. 34-year-old Kelly Cochran and her husband, 37-year-old Jason Cochran, were just like any other couple in that way, except that their promise to each other was unusual and one that few other couples would likely make. Their promise to each other turned out to be deadly. On the night of October 14, 2014, Kelly invited her co-worker, 53-year-old Christopher Regan, to come visit her at home. A few days later, Chris Regan was reported to be missing. An investigation to find Chris began, which resulted in the discovery of his vehicle parked in a park and ride lot east of Iron River, Michigan. There was no sign of Chris, nor what had happened to him. Detectives swiftly turned to Kelly, as she was one of the last people to see Chris before he vanished. Police documents reveal that they discovered that Kelly was having an affair with Chris, and she was soon listed as a person of interest in their investigation. Though police went to Kelly seeking answers or clues about what had happened to Chris, they found very little. In fact, they found suspiciously little. Michigan police brought in the FBI to help in the investigation, and together, both agencies searched Kelly's home. And though they were incredibly thorough, they found nothing. Though there was no proof that could connect Kelly to Chris's disappearance, she remained on the police's list as a person of interest. Soon after the FBI search of her home, Kelly and her husband reportedly packed up and moved away to Lake County, Indiana. For a year, Chris remained listed as a missing person, with investigators finding no leads. Though they had no definitive proof, investigators were almost certain that Chris wasn't just missing and that he had to be dead. Even with this new revelation, police were no closer to finding out what happened to him. But all of that changed when in February 2016, Jason Cochran died of an apparent heroin overdose. Though Kelly described the death of her husband on Facebook as the hardest thing I will ever have to deal with, the investigators of Chris's death had their suspicions piqued to hear that Kelly's husband died under such strange circumstances. A few weeks following Jason's death, Chris's cold case was reopened. Only nine weeks later, Kelly was charged with Chris Regan's death. Initially, she fled Indiana when authorities came to arrest her, but she was eventually found by U.S. Marshals who discovered her in Kentucky on April 28th. Kelly was reportedly interrogated for almost 70 hours about Chris's assumed death. The Indiana Post-Tribune reported that after the grueling hours of questioning, Kelly eventually revealed to the investigators that they should look for clues in a desolate part of the woods in Michigan. There, it was reported that they found a rifle, along with a 22 caliber bullet and a pair of glasses. During the investigation in the woods, a human skull was discovered, with an apparent bullet hole, along with bones and fragments of bone. It was soon reportedly determined that this was the skull of Chris Regan. According to reports, on the night of October 14th, when Kelly invited Chris over to her home, he thought he was spending the night with the woman he had been seeing. But little did he know, they weren't going to be alone. Instead, Jason was also waiting for him. Allegedly, when Jason caught Chris and Kelly together, he shot Chris in the head with a long barrel 22 caliber rifle, like the one found in the woods. Rather than report her husband for the murder of her lover after Chris was dead, Kelly then allegedly helped Jason to dismember his body. Kelly later admitted to investigators that she had found a long cord for an electrical handsaw in order for Jason to cut up Chris's body. Together, 
The couple took Chris's remains in garbage bags to dump in the local woods around Iron River. You see, Kelly had been part of the plan all along. Just like other married couples, Kelly and Jason had made a promise to each other, and Kelly would later state that her pact with Jason was made on their wedding night. They had promised that they would kill off anyone involved in their extramarital affairs, which was exactly what Jason had done to Chris. Various news sources alleged that while Kelly was in custody and being questioned, she reportedly turned her glasses into shivs and used them to threaten anyone who came too close to her. Court documents also revealed that she used the weapons to threaten to take her own life. At the trial for Chris's death, Chris's girlfriend, Terry O'Donnell, said that it was the first time she had seen Kelly. I just remember her staring at me and grinning. Terry said, I took a deep breath and thought she was the scariest person I've ever seen. I was afraid. I couldn't look at her for the rest of the time I was there testifying. Terry said that after she testified, she was panicked. So scared, in fact, that as she drove back home, she just wanted to run as far away from Kelly as possible. Beyond testifying in the murder trial for her boyfriend, Terry had an interesting speculation that she shared. To Terry, the way that Kelly was able to so thoroughly clean up the crime scene after Chris's death was suspicious without some kind of experience doing something similar. Terry said, There's just no way that the first person you choose to kill, you're going to be able to clean up the blood and get rid of the body so that FBI agents can't pull DNA off the walls. At the trial, Kelly was convicted and given a life sentence for the murder of Chris Regan. However, police were still suspicious about her husband Jason's overdose and death. Reportedly, Kelly's answers to investigators' questions about what happened on the night that he died continued changing. Though EMTs had been called to revive Jason after an apparent heroin overdose, an autopsy revealed that his cause of death had actually been asphyxiation. What's more, Kelly had allegedly been disruptive while EMTs were working on her husband's body. After more questioning about this new development, Kelly admitted to intentionally injecting Jason with heroin. The amount of heroin was enough for a fatal overdose, but Kelly ensured Jason's death by smothering him with a pillow. Other reports say that she may have choked him to death or had covered his nose and mouth until he suffocated. Reportedly, after Chris had died, Kelly said she was angry with her husband. She told police that she had to kill him to even the score and get revenge on Jason for killing Chris, who she says was the only good thing in my life. Kelly pleaded guilty to killing her husband. She was officially convicted and sentenced to 65 years in prison. In the space of about a year, Kelly had taken the lives of the two men she had once claimed to love. But this was only the first twist in a series of strange developments. It appeared that other people agreed with Chris's girlfriend, Terry, that it was suspicious that Kelly had been able to hide evidence of Chris's death so well that it remained unfound by the FBI. In fact, people became suspicious of Kelly's possible involvement in other deaths. Colton Gaboyan, Kelly's own brother, spoke to investigators and told them about his fears that his sister could possibly have killed more than the two men. In fact, he worried that she could be a serial killer. Kelly's family reportedly alleged that she may have been involved in the deaths of as many as nine people throughout the Midwest. According to the court filings, Kelly even allegedly claimed responsibility for the deaths of other individuals. Despite this accusation, according to Fox 2 Detroit, Kelly made a plea deal as part of her conviction for Jason's murder and therefore cannot be prosecuted for her possible involvement in any alleged deaths. And though this twist is shocking, it isn't the last twist in this case. Since Kelly's case went viral, a documentary was made about the love triangle and subsequent murders. 
Investigation Discovery's documentary, Dead North, allegedly reveals a startling theory. They reportedly touched on the chance that Kelly and or Jason possibly served parts of Chris's dismembered body to their neighbors during a barbecue. It is claimed that a neighbor alleged that they had eaten a quote, strange tasting burger served by the Cochrans shortly after Chris's death, which they now claim could possibly have been made of human body parts. Though this allegation hasn't been substantiated by authorities, it is just another level to this shocking case. Today's next case is one that has a twist which managed to fool the world. 14-year-old Natasha Ryan from Rockhampton, Queensland, Australia was known as a troubled teen. A later police report allegedly recorded that she had been suspended from school, experimented with drugs, and had reportedly been receiving counseling. On July 12, 1998, Natasha had vanished when taking the dog for a walk. She had purportedly attempted to run away with her boyfriend, Scott Black. The attempt hadn't lasted long. In fact, it was only for two days before she was found to be staying at a hotel by police. Scott had initially been charged with abduction, and though the charge was soon dropped, he was still fined $1,000 for obstructing the police investigation into Natasha's disappearance. Though her family life was tumultuous, things were about to take a turn for the worst. On August 31st, a month after her runaway attempt, Natasha's mother, Jennifer, dropped her off at school around 8.15 a.m. Jennifer would later remark that she thought her daughter appeared to be in good spirits recently. The last time Natasha was seen was two days later as she played video games at a cinema. She was reportedly seen by witnesses leaving with a man in his car. Her parents quickly reported that Natasha was missing, but it wasn't until a month later that her disappearance was brought to the public. Despite her parents' insistence that their daughter had been taken, police were convinced that she had simply run away again. Constable Robert Newton even made a public plea for Natasha to get in contact to tell her family that she was safe. But as a month passed by, and then another, with no sign of Natasha, police soon changed their assessment of what could have happened to her. At this time, two more women in the small city went missing, all within six months of Natasha. And then, on April 22nd, 1999, Nine-year-old Kira Steinhardt was kidnapped as she walked home from her primary school. The crime appalled the public, who soon began to think that the other girls, including Natasha, had possibly been killed by a serial killer living in the area. Devastated, Natasha's parents forced themselves to accept that their daughter was dead. A memorial was even held on May 9th, 2001, for Natasha on what would have been her 17th birthday. Pressure was placed on the police to solve the string of disappearances and suspected murders. Their attention turned to a man named Leonard Frazier. Investigators suspected that Leonard had killed Kira Steinhardt, and soon he was charged and reportedly led investigators to the girl's body. As their suspicions that he had been involved in the other disappearances grew, police set up an elaborate trap for Leonard. They had another inmate, Alan Quinn, who was serving time for fraud, convince him to write a confession letter for the woman's death under the name of Squeaky. Alan told Leonard that the letter would throw suspicion off of him. Instead, all of the conversations between him and Alan were secretly recorded, including the details about the deaths of the three women things that only the killer would know. Leonard revealed details such as the fact that Beverly Lego had been strangled with her own underpants, which were left around her throat when her body was dumped, or that Julie Dawn Turner was throttled with her bra, and that Sylvia Maria Benedetti was beaten with a log. Leonard was soon charged with multiple women's deaths, including Natasha's though he had reportedly denied being responsible for any of them. The recorded conversations between him and Alan were reportedly used against him in court. 
Included as evidence was a statement Leonard allegedly made about Natasha, purportedly saying, quote, well, I hit Natasha and she was unconscious. I drove her to the showgrounds and that's where I murdered her. I took her body out to the pink lily pond near the airport. Though Leonard eventually confessed to several killings and led police to most of the bodies of his victims, Natasha's body was never found. Still, it seemed to many that her killer had finally been caught. But then, three weeks before Leonard's trial was due to begin, everything changed with one fateful letter. According to the New Zealand Herald, the kid's helpline was called by someone who gave their name as Sally. The person claimed that they had run away from home, but that a man was about to be tried for her murder. The counselors who heard the message called the police, but when they were unable to trace the call, it was forgotten. That is, until the police were sent an unsigned letter that said, Natasha Ryan is alive and well. The letter also included a phone number. Investigators tracked the phone number and raided the home it belonged to on April 10th, 2003. What they found there shocked them. The letter was right. Natasha Ryan was alive. Police found her crouched in a cupboard where she was attempting to hide from them. Expecting to find that Natasha had been taken and held against her will all this time, Investigators soon realized that this wasn't the case at all. In fact, she had spent the last four years and eight months living in secret with her boyfriend, 27-year-old Scott Black, just 1.2 miles from her mother's house. Police didn't understand how they had missed this. When Natasha first went missing, they had extensively looked into Scott, but there had been no sign of her. Investigators wanted to know how she had managed to remain hidden for so long. Over the four years she was missing, Natasha had lived as a recluse, moving twice to remain unseen. Whenever Scott's family visited the home, Natasha would hide in the cupboard, sometimes for hours. The curtains were almost always closed so that she wasn't seen. The couple were even cautious enough to only ever put Scott's clothing outside on the line to dry never Natasha's. For almost five years, Natasha never left the house, except reportedly on six occasions when she went to swim at the beach in Yapoon. She spent her days cooking, sewing, reading, and on the internet. Court documents reveal that the letter that outed Natasha is believed to have been sent by one of Scott's relatives, though this wasn't confirmed. When asked why she had stayed hidden for so long, even when her parents had held a memorial for her, Natasha reportedly told investigators, the lie had become too big. According to a police statement, Natasha had not wanted to leave with them when they found her. At Leonard's trial, prosecutor Paul Rutledge announced that the murder charge for Natasha Ryan against Leonard would be dropped, as the now 18-year-old was still alive. Natasha even attended her own murder trial, where she told the court that she had never met Leonard and that he obviously hadn't killed her. Leonard was eventually convicted of the murders of two women and the manslaughter of another. Natasha and Scott were held accountable for their lie. According to The Guardian, Scott was sentenced to three years in prison for lying to the police, though he only served a year. For Natasha's parents, being reunited with their daughter was as if they were seeing a ghost. Rather than feeling flooded with relief, they were also distressed to learn that their daughter had chosen to hide from them for so long, duping the entire world with her lie. Today's final case is one that is still shrouded in mystery years later. 46-year-old Brian Wells was working as a pizza delivery man in 2003 when he was caught up in a complex plot in Erie, Pennsylvania. On August 28th, Brian walked into a PNC bank around 2.20 in the afternoon. Rather than going there to deposit or withdraw his money, instead, Brian handed the bank teller a note that demanded they give him $250,000. When the teller looked up in confusion, 
Brian showed them that he held a shotgun disguised to look like a walking cane with a curved handle. He then also showed them that he was wearing a homemade explosive device around his neck, hidden under his t-shirt. Twelve minutes later, Brian left the bank with a fraction of the money he had demanded, only about $9,000 and a dum-dum lollipop he had casually grabbed off of the counter. He then headed over to a McDonald's next door and looked under a rock for a note. His threat on the bank teller hadn't gone unnoticed, and the police caught up with Brian while he was sitting inside a vehicle in the parking lot of an eyeglass world. He was handcuffed by state troopers when authorities say that he admitted to robbing the PNC bank. He leaned against the police car as the 30-pound bomb around his neck was heavy. Court documents reveal that Brian then claimed he had been attacked by a group of black men who attached the bomb to him while he was delivering pizza. He said that he was given a letter with handwritten instructions. Brian warned the state troopers to stay away from him, saying, I don't have a lot of time. I'm not lying. It's going to go off. Allegedly, he also pleaded, Why is it that nobody's trying to come get this off? And 20 minutes later, the bomb around his neck began to beep for about 10 seconds. Then, it detonated. Brian was killed instantly. Lamont King, who had worked as a Pennsylvanian state police supervisor at the time, said that his eyes got real wide, and then they went to the back of his head, and that was the end of him. A crowd had gathered around the scene as Brian was handcuffed, and so the shocked bystanders watched in horror as he died before their eyes. At the time, police hadn't been certain that Brian was telling them the truth about the bomb, and though they eventually called the bomb squad 30 minutes after finding Brian, it was too late by then. Investigators began looking into the strange and shocking case. The police discovered a series of detailed instructions that had been left for Brian that told him what he had to do to disarm and unlock the bomb around his neck. Brian had to find four keys and a detonation code to free himself. But he was caught by police while finding his third key. One instruction read, Most important rule, do not radio, phone, or contact anyone. Alerting the authorities, your company, or anyone else will bring your death. If we spot police vehicles or aircraft, you will be killed. It was quickly noted that the instructions were written with the words, we and us, which led investigators to believe they were looking for multiple people responsible for the robbery and Brian's death. According to the NY Post, during an autopsy, federal authorities struggled to remove the bomb and ended up decapitating Brian just to get it off. The bomb itself was soon called the Collar Bomb, a name that the case was also known by. For months, there were very little leads in the case. That is, until a seemingly unrelated crime was reported. William Rothstein called state police to tell them that he had a body frozen in his garage. According to an FBI affidavit, Rothstein told investigators that his ex-fiancée, Marjorie Deal Armstrong, had killed her own boyfriend, a man named James Roden. His body was then hidden in the freezer. During the investigation into James Roden's death, Marjorie ended up implicating herself in another crime, the collar bomb. She reportedly pled guilty but mentally ill for Roden's murder in 2005. According to the FBI, Marjorie admitted to a fellow inmate that she had killed him because he threatened to tell people about her connection to the collar bomb. What's more, it appears Marjorie had partners in crime. According to Time.com, William Rothstein was also implicated in the plot and was alleged to have helped build the bomb. And another suspect, a friend of Marjorie's named Kenneth Barnes, allegedly confessed to punching Wells on the day of the heist when he tried to run away. But what was the motive for the plot itself? The goal had reportedly been financial gain, but it has further been alleged that Marjorie had planned to use the money from the bank robbery to pay Barnes to kill her father so she could collect her inheritance. 
Marjorie is alleged to have supplied two egg timers to be used in the collar bomb. According to various news sources, William Rothstein died from terminal cancer before he could be charged for his involvement in the collar bomb. Marjorie Deal Armstrong and Kenneth Barnes were both convicted of conspiracy and armed bank robbery charges. A question remained though, what was Brian's role in the robbery? Was he a randomly targeted victim? Or was he involved in the plot all along? Unfortunately, this answer isn't clear. It appears as if Brian was possibly both a conspirator and victim. According to investigators, Brian may have planned with the others to rob the bank for the $250,000, but he had allegedly believed that the bomb strapped around his neck would be fake. According to the FBI, placing the bomb around Brian's neck was meant to make him look like a hostage and give him an alibi if arrested. When he realized it was real, Brian had attempted to escape. U.S. Attorney Mary Beth Buchanan made a statement and said that their investigation led to the belief that Brian became involved with the conspirators who planned to rob the PNC Bank, but that he eventually became an unwilling participant in the scheme. It had also been alleged that Marjorie had switched the bomb from a fake to a real one, one that would detonate no matter what Brian did perhaps in order to keep her role in the plot hidden. Still, Brian's family was outraged to hear this allegation. According to the NY Post, his autopsy revealed he had been shot with a small bullet, which they took as proof that he had been coerced or forced into the deadly bank robbery plot. They maintain that Brian died as the victim of others' greed. We may never know all of the answers for these three cases, but what we do know for sure is that each case presented a surprising and unexpected twist, which took the investigators down a path authorities never could have seen coming.